Hello viewers and welcome to a new series called Trev's Diecast Corner wherein I will look at my diecast car collection. In this first episode I will just quickly give you a little bit of background. So like many petrol heads, grease monkeys and general car fans I grew up surrounded by diecast toys of everything from cars to planes uh, to tanks and everything else in between. Over the years, until I was around 12 years old, I had put together quite the collection of these little models, playing with them pretty much daily, with the other part of my time being taken up by the wonder that is Lego. Even through my tumultuous teen years, I managed to uh, keep this collection instead of selling them to pay for something else. And for that, I am really glad, because it means that I can now share them with you. As of recently, I have actually started buying diecast cars again, mainly those of real life vehicles that I find interesting, um, although I do still pick up the odd fantasy one. My collection is mainly Hot Wheels Matchbox scales which are often the region of 1 over 64 or 1 64th, or I actually do have a small amount of uh, the slightly larger scale being 1 over 43 or 1 43rd. As a child collector I actually wasn't really that concerned about scales and would actually collect cars with all kinds of scales including some much larger scales such as 1 over 18 or even I even think I had a few 1 over 10 which are, you know if you know what they are they're quite large. Uh, due to space requirements though I have unfortunately had to part ways with them and over the years they've found new homes with new owners. Uh, some of them are actually in the LMM den, uh, the ones that ended up being left over. Uh, unfortunately for those out there who are big fans of model trains, um, there's not really going to be any of that coverage uh, on this series because it's just something that I never really ended up getting into. However, um, you know, the team is growing and the community is growing, so it could be potential that sometime in future there might be content uh, surrounding model railways. So in this first episode we're actually going to be looking at uh, six vehicles that I guess can fall into sort of I guess the commercial bracket, uh, you know vans, trucks, lorries, those sort of things, um, which is slightly different for me as I'm normally talking about cars. So let's have a look at the first option. First up is this absolutely beautiful Citroen Acadian by French manufacturer Majorette. Marked on the base as being number 235, this model comes to us in a 160th scale. Seen here in its post van livery, this model comes to us in a rather striking canary yellow colour. However, when comparing to online resources, my variant appears to have this additional sticker on the hood of the van, almost resembling the planet Saturn. As with many major models, this casting is quite detailed and captures some of the smaller features of the real vehicle that are often missed on models of this scale. Starting on the side of the van, we can see that this rather basic envelope decal, which is actually a transfer instead of a sticker. Beside it, there is a clear plastic window providing view into the loading and storage area of the van. Moving our view to the back of the vehicle, we're presented with the only feature on this model, which is a set of opening doors, formed in white plastic. The doors are quite easy to open on my example, and can be a little loose in play. However, they are nicely detailed, with the leftmost door featuring a moulded number plate, reading 596HN69, which appears to fit the correct format for a French registered vehicle. With the doors open, the loading storage area of the van inside is effectively undetailed with a flat floor, sides and roof. Useful if you are wanting to make up some tiny parcels to put inside. The rest of the rear casting matches the rounded roof line found on the real Acadian. However, there is a lack of detail around the rear light clusters and the silver metal chassis clip breaks the realism. The base of the vehicle is made out of an abrasive metal material and features what looks to be a small drain hole. A single rivet towards the front of the model along with the aforementioned chassis clip hold the model together. Turning the model to now face us head on we can see how nicely detailed this little toy actually is. With a moulded front grille featuring Citroen's classic double chevron logo. The metal chassis is moulded into a hard wearing front bumper which keeps the plastic grille from being easily damaged during play. Similar to the rear of the vehicle, the front headlamps aren't actually coloured in, however they are nicely modelled. 
The clear plastic windscreen also allows viewing of the very basic moulded cabin inside, featuring what looks like a bench seat, steering wheel and dashboard. As like many majorette models of this era, this example comes with a form of suspension, likely to prevent the thin axles from bending out of shape during play. For me, this is another wonderful example of something rather mundane from the team at Majorette. The Citroen Acadian was in production from 1977 through to 1987, and was a sibling of the Citroen Diane passenger car, which stopped its production in 1983. Over the 10 years of production, just over 253,000 Acadians were produced, with 1979 being the most popular year. The Acadian would then be replaced by the considerably more popular Visa-based C15, which was in production from 1984 all the way through to 2005. Our second vehicle is the Satellite TV Truck by Matchbox in 173rd scale from 1989 or 1990. Presented here in a British Sky Broadcasting livery, the model is clearly based on the popular Mercedes-Benz T2 series platform, namely the second generation which ran from 1986 through to 1996. Taking the truck side on, we can see that this model has a lot of nice details and features. Not only does it act as a promotional item for Sky TV, who wouldn't launch operations until 1990, but it was also entertaining enough to be enjoyed by children as a toy. The decals are large and clear and the truck appears to take the name Mobile One. Maybe this was the name for the first Sky News TV truck, who knows. Atop the model is a large slab of dark blue plastic with a small video camera protruding towards the back, unpainted and here appearing in white plastic. The camera does move a full 360 degrees, allowing for some great play scenarios featuring this model. However, the camera is delicate and I would suspect many are now missing this wonderful feature. The rear of the model is quite bland in the paint department, being just white with no decals or stickers. However, the moulding is quite accurate with a ladder, door seams, handles and light clusters all present. Looking at the other side, the decal is mirrored with the petrol filler cap omitted from this side. A nice touch often miss. The front of the vehicle here is slightly out of focus. However, much like the rear of the vehicle, the front is just painted white. However, the Mercedes-Benz badge is clearly moulded and the front grille and light clusters easily reveal this being the second generation of the T2. The windshield is a dark blue and is almost opaque, giving no view to the cabin or interior of the truck. Coming to the base of the truck, we can see that much like many Matchbox models of the era, we have a plastic base, albeit moulded, with embossed information present. No model number is given, however a name, TV News Truck, is printed along the sill. This item was manufactured at Matchbox's Thailand factory. Not pictured here, but the vehicle does feature suspension, much like the Citroen before it, which helps to keep these models in rolling shape after many years of play. The Mercedes-Benz T2 second generation, sometimes referred to as the Series 2, was an update of the previous generation of light trucks, which ran from 1967 to 1986. Many T2s were converted into various styles, including minibuses and fire engines. However, like many commercial vehicles that stopped production over 20 years ago, most T2s are long gone from UK roads, with the occasional minibus or horse box remaining on the road. At number 3 we have a generic model entry, presented here as a motorhome with fantastic 90s style Hawaii Tour Club livery. The base of this model reveals no information than it being made in China and without the original packaging, the manufacturer is unknown. As like many no-name models, there isn't a clear representation of any particular vehicle. With my limited knowledge of trucks and SUVs, definitely those found in North America, it seems to resemble a lot of what was being produced by Ford in the late 90s, namely the Ranger, Explorer and Expedition models. What do you think? The model is extremely light in weight. The rear assembly, the house so to speak, is made from a thin plastic, with the decals transferred directly onto the surface. No stickers here. The house has a few windows present with dark blue plastic glass. A nice touch on this budget model is the presence of a skylight in the top of the home. The rear of the model is a very simple mould with a door, ladder and spare tyre present. Looking at the model from the top, we can see the transfers are quite clear and have stood the test of time. Moving to the front of the vehicle, the cab carries on with its Hawaiian theme, although it is in this rather nice shade of green. The windshield and front headlamps appear to be one continuous piece and are clear in colour providing view into the cabin wherein two seats and the basic dashboard are visible. The steering wheel is mounted however on the right hand side, which seems a little bit unusual. 
The rest of the model is rather basic and without knowing what it is trying to imitate exactly it is hard to say how accurate the detail is. Moving to the bottom of the model we can see the vehicle has a black plastic base held in by one rivet at the front and a clip towards the rear. The model features no suspension and the wheels are cheap to touch although are given an off-road appearance which is quite nice although maybe a little inaccurate for this execution. Basic mouldings of an exhaust and drivetrain are visible but that is it. While I was a young lad I had a fascination with motorhomes and the idea of living in one. I could care less about caravans but motorhomes and RVs seemed much cooler. I actually have a number of these models in my collection although many are generic examples like this. My desire for a motorhome exists even today, hoping to one day own either a Mazda Bongo van or the Nissan Atlas camper van. At position number 4 we have something of a stark contrast to the previous no-name model, an extremely well detailed and appealing 56 Ford pickup by Matchbox from 1996. Presented here in a 1 65th scale, this model started its production in 1996, however I am certain that I obtained this model sometime around 2005. Taking a side profile look at this model we can see that it is quite the chunky boy, much like the real life Ford F100 truck that it is based upon. The model features this really stunning metallic blue paint across the entire body which looks fantastic in sunlight. There are nice details also found on the side profile including panel lines and door handles. There is also a protruding side step which is formed from the plastic base. From this side we can see the biggest letdown on this model and that would be the very flash and gaudy looking wheels. Coming round to the rear of the vehicle we find ourselves a nice surprise, a detailed tailgate. Yes, although this model has no real features to speak of and it was a, just the same price as any other matchbox, it does have some rather nice accents applied to the Ford badge and rear tail lights, giving this model a bit more of an upmarket feel. Considering the period of matchbox in which this was released or which I purchased it, I often mistake this for a Hot Wheels or Tomica model. Moving around to the front of the vehicle and the detail continues with two sparkly headlamps mounted on a chrome effect plastic grille. The prominent hood bulge gives a real sense of size and demonstrates the truly iconic look of the F100 from 1956. At this point I'll also mention that this model has some serious heft to it, weighing a lot more than some of the other brands. Coming to the bottom of the model we can see that the plastic base is of a very glittery silver colour which can make the markings hard to read. The base is held in with two rivets, front and back. The wheels all spin freely but the model has no suspension to mention of yet it does roll very well considering its weight. I probably purchased this during my phase of being really into American classic cars. I will hope to feature many of these models in later episodes. The F series comprised of three model variants, F100, F250 and F350 and were produced between 1952 and 1956. The 1956 F100 was a special variant with a wraparound windshield to set it apart from its predecessors. I want to quickly say that I apologise that the following video for this model isn't very good. Unfortunately the sun decided that it wanted to disappear at the very moment that I began filming. Um, and at the time that I'm now recording this audio it is now raining because it's the British summertime. Sticking to the Ford theme that we're on we will now look at this very 70s orange Ford Transit drop side which has been manufactured here by Matchbox. Released sometime in 1977, this model is part of their super fast range and is identified as model number 66. Focusing here on the front of the Transit, we can see that it is very much a first generation Transit with the large fish mouth grille and bulging headlamps. Although the model has simply been given a lick of orange paint all over, the casting is reasonably well detailed with clear markings for the Ford badge, front grille, headlamps and indicators. The windshield of this model is a peculiar aqua colour but it's clear enough that you can actually see inside the cabin where there are two seats and a steering wheel. Looking at the rear of the vehicle we can see that the drop side bed area is all the same colour as the cap. This is something I probably would want to fix one day, painting it maybe something like black or grey to sort of offset it from the cab. The drop side doesn't move as it is in a fixed position and has unfortunately become bent on my copy over years of play. The only real feature of this model is the presence of a tiny tow hook for attaching small trailers. Moving on to the bottom of the model we can see that the base is made from a die cast metal much like the body which explains why it's so heavy. As you can see from the markings on the bottom here this was from an era when matchbox cars were still being made in England. A clip to the front of the model and a rivet towards the rear holds the chassis to the shell. 
The Transit is maybe one of the most well-known commercial vehicles on UK roads. Almost everyone has either known someone who has owned a Transit or has driven one themselves. Transits, like many popular commercial vehicles, come in a wide range of configurations. Early examples of the trusty Transit are becoming quite scarce to find, however, and this is usually due to them dying of rot after a very hard life on British roads. Finally we have this prized possession of mine, a Kenworth truck with Pizza Hut branding from 1994. This model from Matchbox is based off of a model design from 1981, however the Pizza Hut trailer is copyrighted 1994, which is probably closer to the actual release date of this model. I don't actually have many lorries in my collection anymore, but I hope that once the car boot season kicks off again, I can actually start building some up this year. This particular lorry is actually an American brand, so we would really be calling this a truck. However, I have pretty much zero useful knowledge on such vehicles, so I'm really unable to share much about these. From a quick bit of research, it appears to be the K100 model, but I'm sure a truck fan out there will be able to enlighten us in the comments if that is correct. The cab detaches quite easily from the trailer, allowing for easy storage. The cab itself is presented here in quite a basic black finish, with a few minor details. There are mouldings for the cab doors and for a selection of air horns along the roof. The windshields are clear, but there is no interior, which is a bit of a disappointment and asks the question why go to the pain of making them clear. There are large Pizza Hut logos stamped on both sides and uh, this appears to be a transfer and not a sticker, so it will hold up during play. Moving to the back of the cab, there are two stacks in a chrome finish, although they are actually made out of plastic instead of sort of metal. Um, and they actually connect to the base and on my example one of the stacks has actually become bent through play. My biggest issue that I'm hopelessly trying to demonstrate on the camera here is that the truck doesn't roll very well on its own. The model is fitted with a strange off-road style plastic wheels and something about the axles on my example just doesn't feel up to the normal matchbox quality that I'm used to. Looking to the base of the model, we can see that the model has the aforementioned plastic chrome effect uh, which is actually held in here by three rivets. Now, enough of the cab, let's get on to the main event, the trailer. The trailer scene here has this wonderful Pizza Hut pan pizza, very 90s on a blue and white gradient background. The trailer itself is quite heavy, a lot more so than the cab that pulls it. The top of the trailer is actually quite nice with some ridge lines giving a bit of texture to what is often a flat surface on most models. The base is made from a die cast metal and features two sturdy pegs for the trailer to stand upright when disconnected from the cab. The trailer features the same terrible wheels as the cab with the same issues of not really wanting to roll properly. The nice feature about this trailer is actually that the rear doors open, it's not just a sealed box with a couple of wheels attached to it. Although this can actually be a little tricky to open as can be seen on the camera. Once open there really isn't anything inside the trailer, which is good because it means you could put things in there if you wanted to during play. Like I'd previously mentioned, I don't really know very much about uh, American trucks and so I haven't really got any facts or figures to give you here. All I can say is uh, I've had this model for as long as I can remember. Um, it used to be at my grandma's and I rescued it when they um, moved house. Um, so I'm quite glad to have it because I do remember playing with it quite a lot. And so with that, we finished the first episode of Trev's Diecast Corner. Down at Pizza Hut, you can now get one of our exclusive medium feast pizzas for two for just $6.79. Choose either our meat feast pizza with four different kinds of meat or our cheese feast pizza with our special blend of three cheeses piled high with any two toppings of your choice. Here you are. Whichever one you choose, it's good to know that the only thing we've reduced is the bill. Great feast pizzas for $6.79. At Pizza Hut, you've got it made. Thanks for watching this first episode of Trez Diecast Corner. Um, this is pretty much where I've been living for the uh, last three weeks. Not got out very much and uh, with everything that's going on, they, it makes it difficult as you've probably seen in Laurie's videos for us to get up to the shed to make stuff. Um, we have been thinking about making this sort of content for, for a while. Um, but of course we always prioritise the physical bigger toys over the smaller physical toys. Um, but now that we are inside for who knows when, um, we might as well start making this uh, inside content. So, um, 
this is my first sort of real attempt at any kind of real full-blown episode making uh, from script writing to the content to the camera angles audio editing the whole lot so please let me know what you liked what you don't like do you want for example more cars to be featured less cars to be featured um, I'm hoping to sort of maybe next time get some better angles I know there were some problems in this shot uh, or in some of the shots in this video where things were out of focus for a while or my thumbs in the way uh, it turns out it's very difficult to do it while looking down the viewfinder um, so if you've got any constructive criticism please let me know um, and probably you're going to see some more of this similar content from myself and the rest of the team over the, sort of the coming weeks uh, as we fill in for the lack of normal content Thank you. Bye. I think that's done.